This episode is brought to you in part by Pittsburgh Seminary's Henderson Leadership Conference, September 22nd to 24th with Dr. Diana Butler-Bass. Attend in person or online for lectures and workshops with strategies for ministry amid political and theological divisions. Visit www.pts.edu slash Henderson. This episode is brought to you by Our Daily Bread Ministries, a global media organization that makes the life-changing wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to all. Visit whereyou'refrom.org for more information. That's where, Y-A, from, dot O-R-G. Hi, Truce Podcast listeners. This is Chris. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that we are in the middle of a series about Russia and its impact on the American Christian church. Since it's Christmas, we're going to take a little detour to talk about Russian Christmas. I hope you enjoy. We all know that Christmas can be stressful. The gifts, decorating, cooking, cleaning, and then New Year's comes just a week later. Then it's more cooking, cleaning, and parties. It can be exhausting to have two holidays back to back. But what if you celebrated two Christmases and then two New Year's in a row? Four holidays instead of two. That's the reality for some families, like our guest today. Hi, I'm Jennifer Yeremieva. I'm a writer and also podcast host with the New Books Network. She's the author of Lenin Lives Next Door and Have Personality Disorder Will Rule Russia. Jennifer is from the U.S. Well, my husband is Russian. I'm, I'm not Russian. Um, and so we kind of celebrate both holidays. Both Christmases. Yes, there are two Christmases. Because of a historic divide, the Orthodox Church celebrates Christmas and New Year's on different dates than us. So if you happen to be straddling both cultures, that's four holidays. So it's, we get really busy. Um, around this time of year. I can only imagine. So how does a Russian-American family celebrate that many holidays in such a short amount of time? Why are there two Christmases? And get ready, we're going to try out another recipe. Unlike our stroganoff, this one is an acquired taste. Can you describe the look of it? It looks like um, it looks like someone make, baked a pie and dropped it. I almost thought it was a pie at first, actually. You're listening to the show that uses journalistic tools to look inside the Christian church. We press pause on the culture wars to explore how we got here and how we can do better. I'm Chris Starin, and this is Truce. Let's begin with Christmas. We'll discuss this in some detail in a few weeks, but... Russia is pretty closely tied to the Russian Orthodox Church. It's okay if you don't know anything about Orthodox Christianity. I posted a video on our website that takes a deeper dive. For now, just know that hundreds of years ago, the Catholic Church split. It became two churches, the Roman Catholic Church in Rome and the Orthodox Church in Constantinople. The whole Western world used to be on what was called the Julian calendar. That was how they marked their holidays, festivals, harvests. But for the reasons we're about to cover, the calendar wasn't so hot. So a new one was created. There were now two different calendars, the old Julian one and the shiny new Gregorian calendar. The Roman Catholic Church adopted the new Gregorian way of tracking days, and the Orthodox Church stayed with the old Julian one. This, my friends, is the story of two competing calendars and two competing churches. In this corner, clocking in at over 2,000 years old, we have the Julian calendar! The Julian calendar was invented by Caesar and an astronomer named and I may be saying this wrong, sausages? Sausages? They tried to figure out how many days, hours, and minutes should fit into a calendar year. They worked hard at figuring this out, but sausages 
overestimated. He got a little too excited. He overshot the length of a year by 11 minutes and 14 seconds. Which, you know, doesn't seem like that much, but in just three years, the calendar was off by over half an hour. By the 1500s, those extra minutes and hours meant that the Julian calendar had everybody off by 10 days. 10 days. So along came a scrappy new competitor. In the other corner, and only 500 years old, the big, the bad, Gregorian calendar. The old Julian calendar was way off. So in 1582, Pope Gregory VIII declared that they now use the Gregorian calendar. That's Gregorian for Gregory. Get it? That was the Pope, though. He was the head of the Catholic Church and not the Orthodox Church. They were their own separate entity, and they didn't feel like switching. Yeah, this new calendar was more efficient, but they weren't going to stop backing their fighter. So the Orthodox Church, in some cases still to this day, especially in Russia, uses the old Julian calendar. The Orthodox Church stayed with the Julian, and the Catholic Church went Gregorian, which is the calendar you and I use today. That means that countries that align themselves with the Julian calendar, like Russia, drifted further and further away from the rest of the world. And in the sort of many centuries, uh, the discrepancy, which was very small, actually got bigger and bigger. One day off, then two days off. Pretty soon, there's a gap of three days between the two calendars. And then four. So at the eve of the revolution. That's the Russian revolution in which the Romanovs were overthrown. Um, in 1917, if you travel to Russia, you would, you know, have a time change, obviously, but you would also have a date change of 13 days. And so uh, Russian Christmas is on January 7th. Russian Christmas is 13 days after American Christmas because the Julian calendar is 13 days behind the Gregorian calendar. Since the revolution, Russia no longer follows the old calendar, but the Orthodox Church does, which means Orthodox holidays are still on the old calendar. If you live in a family that is both Russian and American, you get Christmas on December 25th, and 13 days later, another Christmas. By the way, there is also a second New Year's. That can keep a person pretty busy, especially if your family is both Russian and American and you want your kids to experience their full heritage. That means two Christmases and two New Year's. For us, um, Western Christmas is, is the bigger one, but we get the tree up and keep it up until what's called Old New Year's, which is, of course, January 13th. They are celebrating from the first Christmas to the second New Year's, which must be a marathon. So the tree is almost dead by the time we get it. Who are you overwhelmed yet? I mean, I'm, I'm tired just thinking about hosting four different holidays. So let's take a short break. And when we come back, we'll hear about the different ways that Russians observe Christmas, including how their idea of Santa is very different than ours. And you'll learn about what may be the grossest salad I have ever made and hopefully will ever make. We'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by No Small Endeavor, the acclaimed podcast from Great Feeling Studios and PRX. In each episode, host and award-winning theologian Lee C. Camp sits down with courageous and impassioned people like Hollywood legend Rob Reiner and civil rights hero Reverend James Lawson, talking about what it means to find true happiness and flourish in day-to-day -day life. And if you're looking for somewhere to start, why not check out the recent episode with award-winning journalist and best-selling author Tim Alberta on Christian nationalism's role in the Republican Party. Follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Russians celebrate their holidays on different days than those of us in the United States. 
thanks to the ever-confusing differences between the old Julian calendar and our current Gregorian calendar. They also celebrate the actual holidays a little differently, too. Like Orthodox Christmas, the one from the Julian calendar that is 13 days after ours. Actually, it goes back to World War I um, when Christmas trees were outlawed as being too German. That tradition certainly uh, was not a, a, a Russian one. It was brought to Russia uh, by the wife of Nicholas I in the early part of the 19th century. And Empress Alexander was a German princess and she uh, brought the first Christmas tree, much like Prince Albert brought the first Christmas tree to England when he was married to Queen Victoria. The Christmas tree was brought to Russia by a Prussian what would later be called a German. So it was banned during World War I, when, you know, Germany was the enemy. The Christmas tree, with all of its lights and decorations, disappeared during World War I. So we have the Soviets who've come to power in, in 1917, and of course religion is the opiate of the masses. Which is something Karl Marx said. Marx was one of the founding thinkers behind communism. And... Clearly, he did not like religion. So when the communists took over Russia... It's kind of almost like the Grinch that, that stole Christmas. Um, the Komsomols, the, these are the young sort of Eagle Scouts of the revolution, decide that on this day there's going to be like a day of forestry or a day of industry, and so everybody goes out and does volunteer work. And there are wonderful posters of, of the time of sort of hardy Soviet youth um, working with an old sort of slightly drunk-looking Father Christmas kind of shaking his fist at them. Christmas was done away with, and in its place, in typical Soviet fashion, they made it into a work day. Why rest and celebrate when you can work? That poster of them with Father Christmas is basically saying, hey, we don't need Christmas and presents. We've got chores, baby. Oh, you crazy Soviets. And in 1922, um, Alexandra Kalantai, who was one of the um, sort of inner ring of Lenin's uh, circle, she penned a really famous tract about imagining how life would be in 1970. And she imagined how the communists would be celebrating Christmas as sort of an archaic old holiday, but that there would be uh, so much plenty um, that they would no longer even imagine that you would need a religious holiday to give gifts because everybody would have everything that, that he or she needed. Which was decidedly not the case. The Soviet Union was marked by on-again, off-again food shortages. The Soviet dream was to mock the old, sentimental superstitions of religion, which sounded all well and good for people at the top. But, well, we little people like our traditions. But by 1930, I think people were, were sort of pining for the Christmas trees and the traditions. Pining? Get it? Pining for the Christmas trees? <laughs> this season has featured more puns than the other two combined. Anyway, back to the story. And so a man named Pavel Potyshev, who we think of as the man who saved Christmas, in 1935, he wrote a... Um, a letter to Stalin that appeared in the newspaper. So we have to assume this was kind of a PR stunt um, dreamt up by Stalin. Who would dare write to them and request that something be done differently? Like, which publisher under the Soviets would dare publish an article advocating for change? Unless the government wanted to look accommodating. So Pavel, who was probably prompted by Stalin asked to bring back the Christmas tree. Not the religious traditions, but um, to bring back the trees um, for all children and to allow this to happen. But it was made clear that New Year's would be the primary holiday rather than Christmas, and trees should be topped with proletarian images rather than um, Christian ones. And so you had, uh, Christmas, you had uh, New Year's trees uh, sort of capped with red stars. And of course, nothing says festive like symbols of the working class. New Year's was to be the big holiday, not Christmas. Take the focus away from the religious aspects by going big on New Year's. And that has really survived to this day. Christmas is still kind of a minor um, religious holiday that no one quite understands what it's about. Um, and if they know anything, they probably know more about its, um, its kind of pagan forebear, which is called Kalida. Uh, which was sort of an end-of-the-year fertility rite. It's worth noting that Christmas, the roots of our Christmas in the United States, can also be traced back to a pagan holiday. 
this one called Saturnalia. Our modern Christmas was placed at the same time as this pagan festival in order to give Christians a celebration of their own, so they wouldn't have to feel like they had to take part in a pagan festival. It's kind of like how so many churches do trunk or treat or harvest festivals instead of Halloween. Our Christmas was just that, an alternative to a pagan festival. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just something good to know. True story, I was once in a steak and shake restaurant and the waitress got really upset when she learned that we are Christians because she thought that Christmas was just Christians trying to absorb a pagan holiday. In reality, it was us giving them an alternative. So in case you're ever in steak and shake, now you know. In Russia, instead of Santa Claus delivering presents, they have their own version of that jolly man. In Russia to this day, we have not Santa Claus or Father Christmas, but Grandfather Frost, who's kind of a wizened old, kind of like a Gandalf the Wizard kind of type. And he goes around with his great niece, the Snow Maiden. It kind of seems like a good setup for Frozen 3, right? I mean, come on, a Snow Maiden? Both Grandfather Frost and his great niece are dressed not in red, but in blue. And they make frequent appearances um, around town, and so they're not quite as secret um, as, as Santa Claus, not quite as stealth. And they're present at all what's called the Christmas tree uh, sort of receptions. Um, they'll come in and give gifts. So there are gifts, and there are two jolly figures giving them out, but what about the food? Whereas we tend to do ham and mashed potatoes, they do... Champagne, tangerines, which uh, in the Soviet period came from the warmer uh, environs of, of the Soviet Union. And so, uh, for my husband anyway, the smell of a tangerine is the smell of Christmas for him. Tangerines and champagne are pretty harmless. But I ask you, what international holiday would be complete without a totally gross recipe. So there's a special kind of molded mayonnaise, heavy mayonnaise-based molded salads, which are really disgusting. Um, but there again, that's what <laughs> that's what everyone wants, including one that's really lugubrious. It's called herring under fur coat, and it's um, sort of boiled beets and hard-boiled eggs and uh, potatoes and cut up pickles and all of it kind of mashed together with a ton of mayonnaise and topped with um, grated cheese. It's really disgusting. Um, but that's what everyone has. <laughs> yeah. And herring as well. Mayonnaise, pickles, and herring. I buy a lot of mayonnaise. <laughs> I found a recipe for herring under fur coat. If you're brave enough, you can make this yourself by following the instructions in the show notes for this episode. Believe it or not, this recipe is in your device right now. But I didn't just stop at giving you the recipe. To truly get the spirit of Russian Christmas, I made herring under fur coat and took it to an honest-to-goodness real party. Everybody's gathered around and uh, we're gonna go out and sing some Christmas carols and I brought, to a chili cook-off, I brought mayonnaise, beets, carrots, potatoes, and fish. And I'm just gonna find somebody who'll eat it with me. Can I tell you that it doesn't look very good? No, it doesn't. Would you be willing to try some herring under fur coat? Yes. I've got these crackers here. You can try them. It's really good. Is it? Yes. You like it? What does it taste like? Like pickled herring with mayonnaise. That's good because that's that's what it is. Okay. There's a good combination. I like it, yeah. Any other takers? If you're making it, you better be eating it. Okay. Let's get me a cracker here. That is disgusting looking. Who does this to their friends? Here we go. Stop this. I'm not trying to try it. His mouth is too full. <laughs> you get the herring right away. You really get the herring right away. <laughs> it's worse as it goes on, too. <laughs> I like it. You like it? Yeah. Oh my goodness. We're like we're like at half. Half the people like I'm not it. Not a fan of the mayonnaise, but And this is the last party I'll ever be invited to. <laughs> I'm just gonna enjoy it. Chris, we gotta keep you. We'd love to know how you're celebrating this year. Take a picture of your celebration and tag us on social media. We are at, at Truce Podcast. 
If you're brave enough to make this herring salad for Christmas or New Year's, please tag us in a photo. I'd love to know if you had as much fun as we did. As for Christmas, Jennifer said that, though it is making a comeback in post-Soviet Russia, New Year's is still the big holiday. However you celebrate this Christmas, I wish you the very best. Safe travels, loving friends and family, and of course, lots of great food. The Truce Podcast is listener supported. And if you can't think of what to give to that special someone for Christmas, why not make a donation to our show in their name? We're working towards a goal of doing this show full time. And with your help, we can do it. I'm also raising money so I can attend the Spark Christian Podcast Conference this February. Your donation can help me get there. And if you give a little each month on Patreon.com, you will get access to bonus content not heard anywhere else. We've got some great stuff on there, including an extended interview with Phil Vischer, the creator of VeggieTales. Go check it out. You can get Jennifer's books, Lennon Lives Next Door, and Have Personality Disorder, Will Rule Russia, anywhere you get your books. There are also links in our show notes. Sign up for our email list, learn more about my books and movies, and more on our website at trucepodcast.com. God willing, we'll be back in two weeks with more stories examining the Christian church. Subscribe to the podcast so that you get every new episode as it's released, which should be every other Tuesday. From the historic town square in Jackson, Wyoming, under the elk antler arches, I'm Chris Sarin. This is Truce.